university system? Well, the diversity bureaucracy is just a grotesque waste of resources. If you want to know why college tuition is so obscenely expensive, look no further than these metastasizing sinecures. Uh, the, the Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at UCLA, the University of California, Los Angeles, uh, averages over $400,000 a year for absolutely nothing. Uh, these, these bureaucracies are premised on the idea that colleges are lethally sexist and racist, that students of color and females are literally at threat of their lives on a college campus. This is a complete insane narcissistic delusion. There has never been an environment more tolerant of precisely those traits that can still get you uh, stoned or killed in other parts of the world than today's American college campus. So these diversity bureaucrats who are multiplying at a, an alarming rate uh, are dedicated to a fiction and they are cultivating in students ever more arcane species of self-involvement to think of themselves at, at risk, to think of themselves as victims of racism and sexism, whereas in fact they are the most privileged human beings in history because they have at their fingertips the thing that Faust sold his soul for, which is knowledge. Uh, they are surrounded by caring, open-minded, liberal adults who want all of their students to succeed they, the faculty, every single faculty search at a college campus is one desperate effort to find remotely qualified females and, and faculty of color who've not been snatched up already by better endowed institutions and far from discriminating against so-called underrepresented minorities in student admissions, that is blacks and Hispanics, virtually every selective college today employs vast racial preferences to admit underrepresented minorities. So the idea that colleges are infected by systemic bias is a complete untruth. And yet, that is the premise of these bureaucracies. But as, as much as these bureaucracies deserve to be condemned and extirpated root and branch, they are just part of an entire ideology of victimhood that exists throughout the faculty. Uh, it's not just the bureaucrats. The uh, large swaths of the faculty are also devoted to cultivating this idea that the West is uniquely the source of all things evil in the world, bigotry, sexism, patriarchy, rape culture, you name it. Uh, and so you've got a double whammy there where from the moment a student steps on campus, his freshman orientation is inevitably going to feature little seminars in white privilege and toxic masculinity. Uh, his residential advisors, the, the students who are supposed to be uh, you know, overseeing dormitory life, uh, they are inevitably wildly lefty. Uh, and, and in classes, all too often, students are taught to read the greatest works of Western civilization through the lens of racial and gender victimology. There's a lot of scientific, valid evidence to take from these works and really powerful stories to take from these works yes. and not just push them to the side because they were written by someone. Right. It's insane. Yeah. It's absolutely insane. I am so grateful that I was in college in the 1970s before feminism and multiculturalism attacked the canon. So while I wasted vast amounts of time trying to master a particularly arcane literary theory called deconstruction or post-structuralism, uh, something that I now regard as a dead end intellectually, nevertheless, uh, we were reading the greatest works without anybody thinking to complain about the gonads and melanin of their authors. So my freshman year in my major English poets class, I read Chaucer, 
Spencer, Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen, Milton's Paradise Lost, Wordsworth, Wallace Stevens, the Romantic Poets, Shelley, Keats, uh, and my ears were filled with beauty, with the beauty of Milton's Comus, the extraordinarily erotic, sensual writing of Book Four of Paradise Lost, uh, and I, I wasn't given an excuse to reject these works simply because they weren't written by a female. I can think of nothing less relevant to whether a book is worth reading than the race and gender of its author. Yeah, the, the, the message of the writing as you read it, whether or not you know the gonads or the melanin right. of the author is the most important thing is what you can actually right. take from the writing. Um, and I think that's super important to, to start seeing things in that light because that way there's like you have said also there's science is science if you it doesn't matter what your skin color or religion or race is gender is just contribute to science yeah <laughs> there's no yeah there's no um, female physics there's no there's none of that just contribute to science um, to that foundation. Well, you're speaking now idealistically, and of course, now, well, we've, we, since the 1980s at least, we heard about multicultural math, and there was, in fact, for K through 12, this idea that math should be somehow taught to try and close the skills gap with blacks and whites in some kind of black way. Uh, that was specious back then. And it remains specious today, but, but yes, what our greatest risk we're facing now is that the STEM departments in universities, that is the science, technology, engineering, and math, are now being invaded by this absurd diversity ideology. And you have department after department saying, we're not going to hire the best scientists, we're going to hire the best female scientists or the best black scientist, that shouldn't matter. Uh, you have the National Science Foundation, which is the nation's premier funder of basic research. It's a, a government agency created by Congress in 1950 to support uh, non-applied research in the science. And it now is committed to the diversity ideology. It argues that the only good science is diverse science. It's ridiculous. I don't care if the lab that finally breaks through on, on the causes and cures for Alzheimer's is all female, all male, all Asian, or all Jamaican. I don't care. It's a universal language. They should be the best. And China, in the sciences at least, remains committed to meritocratic hiring. Uh, if we continue down this path of putting excellence below some kind of gender and race proportionality in our science labs and hiring, we are going to lose our, our competitive edge. And this is a destructive point of view that is not limited to university campuses. It's also in the private sector now, where you have the big Silicon Valley tech firms firing people if they challenge feminist orthodoxy. There's a lawsuit that's been fi filed against YouTube and Google uh, by a former a manager in the HR department who refused to go along with the mandate to interview only females, blacks, and Hispanics for entry-level engineering jobs. So these Google and YouTube were willing to turn their backs on what may be the best engineering talent if that talent was white, male, or Asian. Uh, this is reckless, to say the least. There's so many ways to, to go with this. I want to. I'm glad you mentioned corporations and the way that the product from the university ends up then coming into the corporate environments and continuing that this type of behavior into mm -hmm. the corporate environments. Right. So okay, so we start. We want to start by talking about STEM because this is one of the most important fields for our future across the world is figuring out how to properly engineer 
uh, and design the future technologies that are going to be influencing the exponential technology next couple of decades. Right. So we want to be at the forefront. We want our children to be at the forefront. Children around the world, we want to be at the forefront. And we, we see, here's an, here's, here's an issue. Here's a way to frame the issue that I think makes it relatable across people's minds is that we've never wanted 50% of the military to be female. It's just a nonsensical statement. Just <laughs> If only that were the case, sorry, yeah, I mean, you're, you're operating from a p position of rationality. Uh, in fact, we, the military now has been overtaken by gender politics as well. I've always said we're never going to have a female in the NFL because Americans understand that football is important, but we now uh, have the preposterous idea of females in infantry ground combat units which is just completely blind to the inherent differences between male and female, the structure of their pelvises, bone structure, muscle structure, as well as to the inevitable introduction of Eros and its disruption to combat uh, unit cohesion of having integrated ground combat unit. Uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely preposterous. Uh, so no, there's that the military is not free from this. In fact, it has now massive diversity bureaucracy. It has gender quotas everywhere, uh, and everybody's being packed off to implicit bias training and microaggression training. So your, your presupposition was uh, an understandable one, but I'm afraid you're behind the times, Alan. <laughs>